Good morning, Church. Welcome to our virtual Sunday at Home service. I pray that all of you are trusting God, hanging in there, and taking care of each other in your household, and really staying at home, even though we all may have a strong urge to go out for bubble tea, roti chanai, or just to meet with friends. Sai, roti chanai. Well, I am grateful, very grateful to God that I can at least still greet you this Sunday morning, even though we still can't physically meet yet. What a week it has been. In fact, it really has been less than a week since the movement control order was enforced last Wednesday, although it feels much longer than that. And I know we all can't wait for things to get back to normal. During this time, the pastoral team and elders have been meeting and working behind the scenes using online conferencing software to make sure various things are taken care of. Last Sunday's service had some hiccups with the sermon links not working for some of you. Apologies for that. We were able to fix it later that day, so do check out our website at emmanuel-efc.org often for announcements, updates, as well as the Sunday service at home page. Moving forward, the pastoral team will continue to prepare for each Sunday service and have the sermons and announcements recorded by video. Like all of you, I have not been able to meet with the team face to face since we stopped our physical church services. So for all we know, Pastor Hon Chen might have grown a beard. In a few weeks time, beards may become fashionable again. I can almost hear the wives and girlfriends groaning in horror. On a more serious note, if there's anything good that can come out of the COVID-19 pandemic, it must be that it will cause us to re-evaluate our priorities before God and all the relationships we take for granted when life is comfortable and smooth sailing. As mentioned by Brian Tapp, a seminary professor and general editor of Pamelios, COVID-19 smashes all our idols of security, prosperity, and wellness. We are not self-sufficient. Although we can achieve great things, we are, in fact, small. But we believe in a big God. And even though we are faced with something that none of us have ever faced in our lifetimes, we need not succumb to paralyzing fear, doubt, or suspicion. And why not? Precisely because we trust in a Saviour who is familiar with suffering, sorrow, rejection, and even death on the cross. But our hope is not in a Saviour who merely died for us, but in the risen Christ. God is truly our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Christianity provides us with deep resources from an infinite God to help us cope with COVID-19 and other situations that threaten to overwhelm us. Having said that, it doesn't mean that we go by our strong faith because God is on our side and we behave like bulls in a china shop. We must still take all the required precautions. Please, let us not put God's faithfulness nor the limits of our own foolishness to the test. We are in uncharted territory with an extremely virulent and contagious virus. Human life is sacred before God and we would do well to treat it as such, both our own life and that of others. So please comply fully with the directives from the government to stay home, to socially, physically distant and isolate ourselves and not to go out for non-essential activities. Complying with these rules is the Christian thing to do, and it is also loving our neighbours. Stay home and catch up with your reading of God's Word and other good books, as well as home projects, your favourite Korean dramas, and not least, calling each other to check in. Some announcements to take note of. Firstly, it would have been so much better to meet in church to announce this, 
but on behalf of the elders and the church board, and with joy, I would like to welcome Pastor David Lowe and Kim Key back from sabbatical. With immediate effect, Pastor David will rejoin our church as an elder and as pastor at large. His pastoral and ministry experience will be a much needed addition to help our church navigate the extremely challenging times ahead of us. More details on his role will be made later. Do send him your virtual thumbs up, and when this is all over, do catch up with them. Secondly, the pastoral team has organized a prayer and fasting initiative that started yesterday and will be until March 31st to intercede and plead with God to intervene against the COVID-19 pandemic. Most of you would have received the announcement through WhatsApp as well. Please click the link in your WhatsApp or visit the church website for details and sign up to pick a day of individual prayer and fasting and pray through the prayer items. We have also designated Sunday, today and March 29 as corporate pray and fast days from morning until 3 p.m. Let's come together in our individual homes and spend time before God in earnest prayer and fasting. Third, the family day which was planned for May 7th will now be indefinitely postponed. We will pick another day after things are back to normal. Fourth, the Sunday school team have prepared activities and materials for parents to use with their children at home. So again, check out our Sunday service at home page for the details. And last but not least, please contact the pastoral team if you have any needs or issues you require help or prayer with. Our contact details are in the WhatsApp announcement and website. We will also be gradually reaching out to as many of you as we can to check in and find out how things are with you and your family. Let's now spend some moments in prayer as we remember our country and full-time workers. Heavenly Father, you are the Lord God, creator of everything that exists, ruler of the entire universe, and you are good. We praise you and thank you because in Christ, you have called us to be your people. We praise you for your sovereignty and majesty, even in times of trouble, pain, sorrow, sickness and uncertainty, we thank you because Jesus, our Saviour, understands suffering and pain, having endured the cross for our sake. Help us to always be thankful to you in our hearts and attitudes because of all that you have done for us through the Gospel. We want to continue praying for our nation and the world as she goes through the COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting economic fallout. We pray for the frontline doctors, nurses, and medical workers, thanking you for their sacrifice to care for the sick and infected patients. Grant them your protection so that they will take all the protective measures to ensure they don't get infected themselves. Grant them strength and stamina as they work long hours. At the same time, enable them to truly rest and recover their sharpness to help in the fight against the virus. For those who have been infected, we ask, O oh Lord, for your healing so that they may recover and return home. We pray for ourselves as ordinary citizens that we will take this pandemic very seriously and not be foolish or ignorant about it. We pray that we will all comply with the directives to stay home and practice social distancing and even isolation. For those who are or will be experiencing economic hardship due to the pandemic, we pray that there will be sufficient support structures in their families or from government aid to help them through this period until they can get back on their feet again. As a church, we too pray we will be sensitive to the, to the economic needs of our members and help where it is needed. Above all, Lord God Almighty, we pray that you will sovereignly intervene and put an end to the pandemic, either miraculously or through the means of science and a vaccine. 
Heavenly Father, we continue to also uphold our full-time workers before you. For women, we pray that you will grant her wisdom and the ability to lead the Spices team in their ministry to parents and special needs children. As the centre is also closed during this period, grant Huimin and her team creativity using different means to continue connecting and checking in with each other, as well as with the parents and donors. During this enforced downtime, enable the team to refocus, to reprioritize and re-strategize their plans, curriculum and approach to, to be able to hit the ground running again when the centre reopens. We also commit Pastor Hon Chen and Shaleen into your care as well. We pray that you will enable them both to grow in their joy and trust in you, as well as their influence in our church as they minister to the different groups. Hon Chen with the college group and young working adults and Shaleen with the YA and the ladies in our midst. Lord, equip Hon Chen with the vision and joy of shepherding our church as we move forward in very challenging circumstances. We also pray that you will keep them both safe and healthy during this time and healing for the back problems that Shaleen has been experiencing since the past couple of years. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's uh, sermon is a continuation of Romans and the scripture reading is taken from Romans chapter 2 verses 1 to 16. And I'll just read out from the NIV. Romans chapter 2, verses 1 to 16. You, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of His kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when His righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honour and immortality, He will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. First. For the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honour and peace for everyone who does good. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favouritism. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. This is the word of God. And now Pastor Hon Chen will preach his message. Hi Church, it is my privilege to be able to share the word of God with you today. And I trust that as you listen to this, that the presence of God is with you and that He's speaking to you especially in these difficult times. I believe where there are obstacles, there are also opportunities. And both are two sides of the same coin. And there are many opportunities to deepen your faith and trust in God. 
And in these times, there are opportunities to deepen your love for each other, showing care and also praying for each other. Let us start with a word of prayer before we dive into the word. Fun heaven, we thank you for the gospel of Christ. We realize that we are forgetful people. We are people that take for granted of this free gift of the gospel. So Lord, we pray today as we are looking afresh what the gospel means and what the judgment of God means. We pray, Lord, that you would inspire us and you would challenge us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul gave us the summary of the gospel in chapter 1 about how a person who is not right with God can be made right with God. Following that, Paul explained at length from chapter 1 to 3 about how bad we are before he tells us how good God is by offering us the gift of righteousness. Knowing full well the gravity of the bad news, it helps us appreciate how wonderful the good news is. You know, we are not just bad sinners, but we are also totally helpless. We have nothing to show to redeem ourselves. Not before God's wrath and judgment. Paul had to do that because if we are honest with ourselves, our pride and ego makes us death to the reality of our human condition. Yeah, we say those horrible people, those who worship idols, those who engage in homosexuality, those wicked and godless people, for sure they deserve God's judgment. But mm, not me. I'm pretty good, so not me. It is like the people that are still roaming around the streets, the Pasa, the Kopitiam, after the movement control order started. Paul needed three chapters, but we Malaysians, we needed three special announcements, two from Yidin and one from the Agong himself, pleading everyone to stay home. We are prideful, we think we know better. Oh, the government is overreacting. Surely we will not be infected. Similarly, Paul is trying to persuade us that this is serious. We, those who think that we are good enough, we are also in serious trouble. For many, this is disturbing news to hear that we are utterly bad and sinful. If you were to ask the general people, many would say they are good enough to enter into heaven. They would say that because they, they would say that because they do not have an understanding of God's judgment. And today we'll be looking at the theme of God's judgment, without which we wouldn't fully understand the salvation that God has gifted us. So point number one, no one can escape God's judgment, even those that are good. The Jews believe that they can escape God's judgment. Why? Because they will say, we are God's chosen people, we have the law, we have circumcision, we are pretty good people, so we are spared, right? Paul tells them, hold on, you are totally mistaken. Paul explains to us that those who think they are pretty good people exhibit these behaviors. First, in verse 1, they are judgmental. Second, verse 4, they take God's patience for granted. Verse 5, they are stubborn and unrepentant. Verse 8, they are self-centered. Verse 8 to 9, they reject the truth and follow evil. A story is told about an elderly couple who finished their wonderful dinner at a restaurant. On their way back, nearing their home, almost reached home, the wife suddenly remembered. She forgot something. She said, dear, I, I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry, but I think I left my purse at the restaurant. Can we turn back and pick up my purse? The husband turned red and he was really angry and shouted and scolded at her. 
Why are you so forgetful? Why are you so absent-minded? You know, you're wasting our time, you're wasting the petrol. But he had no choice but to turn back. And all the way through, he was scolding her the entire journey. The wife, knowing she's the one at fault, could only sit there quietly and tolerate all that scolding. Arriving at the car park, the wife opened the door, almost heading to the restaurant, and the husband turned towards her and told her, Dear, dear, wife, can you wait for a while? Uh, while you're getting your purse, could, could you remember to take my wallet too? I left it there as well. So true, we are so harsh with others, but we tend to forgive and excuse ourselves. We tend to be very strict and harsh in judging another person's moral standard and are lenient with ourselves. I realize I do that too with my wife, Shalene. I, whenever she's late for something, I will have a righteous indignation. See, you are late again. Why don't you uh, track your time better and be early next time? And I'll be angry with her. But then, the next moment when I'm the one that was late, I will make excuses. Ah, don't worry lah. Ah, yo, we're still early. We can make it in time. Oh, the person that they are, we are meeting, don't worry about them. They're okay with, with us being late. See? Such double standard. These Jews that Paul is talking about, they do not realize their own shortcomings. Although they do not worship man-made idols, but they idolize their own righteousness. They are so self-righteous that they don't see their need for saving. They don't see their need for God. And because of that, they are stubborn and unrepentant. They store up God's wrath even more and more. They do not realize that every single day that they are living, it is because God has been so rich in kindness and patience. God withholds his judgment upon the world. Why? Because he desires for none to perish, but for everyone to come to repentance. You know, we are living on borrowed time, as it were, so that we are given the opportunity to turn to God. We cannot come to a saving faith in our Lord Jesus Christ if we have not first sincerely acknowledge that we are sinners. There's just nothing we can bring to God to buy or to earn our salvation. And we are in desperate need of rescue. Watchman Nee, a highly respected Christian leader in China during the 20th century, related this story. He says that a group of young Christians went for a swim in the river. Since most were not good swimmers, they stayed carefully at the banks so that they won't drown. One of the brothers got out a little too far and began to struggle in the deep water. Realizing that he is in trouble, he began to cry out to the others, Help! Save me! The others were already out of the water and drying themselves. The person drowning trashed his arms and legs in a futile attempt to keep his head above water. Watchman Nee knew that there was one experienced swimmer there, so he quickly grabbed him and asked him for help. But strangely, this experienced swimmer calmly watched the man's plight, but made no move to save him. Everyone else screamed, why don't you do something? But the man just stood there, seemingly unconcerned. After a few moments, the drowning man could not stay afloat anymore. His arms and legs grew tired, he back, and he began to sink underwater. Now, the experienced swimmer quickly went to the river, pulled him to safety. Once after everything was calm, Watchman Nee asked him, Hey, how could you just stand by and watch your brother drown, ignoring his cries for help? But the man calmly explained, If I were to jump in immediately and try to save a drowning man, he would clutch me in panic and pull me under with him. In order for him to be safe, he must come to the end of himself and cease struggling, cease trying to save himself. Only then he can be helped. 
Have we come to a realization that we are utterly sinful and is in, in need of God's rescue? Do we realize that our Christian upbringing or even having Christian parents or even the fact that we attend church every other week or even our baptism, our relative goodness can never save us. Now on to our second point. God's judgment will be perfectly fair. As we look at the world around us, we may be disillusioned with our justice system or the lack of it. See, generally our justice system has maintained order and brought resolution to victims. But the truth is, there will never be complete fairness in courts. Many even get away from facing the penalty for their crime. People with power, people with money are able to skew the justice system in their favour. And there are many unsolved cases where the perpetrator is never found or caught. One example is the forced abduction of Pastor Raymond Cole. And we have organisations such as Innocence Project that make it their mission to seek justice for innocent people that are wrongly convicted. Our disillusionment with our justice system may taint our view of God's justice and judgment. But this passage here reminds us that God's judgment perfects what our justice system strives to achieve but is never able to. Verse 2. Verse 2 says that God's judgment is based on truth. Recently, I watched the Netflix documentary series called Dirty Money. Episode 2 is all about the 1MDB scandal. And many individuals that were privy to the case were interviewed. Claire Rucastle, the whistleblower, Justo, Tony Pua, Anwar, even Mahade, and even our previous, previous Prime Minister himself, Najib. There was a scene where the reporter interviewed a group of fishermen and this is what they said. They said, Najib, dia itu makan duit atau tak makan duit? Bukan, kita boleh tahu. Itu duit pergi mana ke, siapa bagi ke, kita takkan tahu. They're saying that whether Najib steals or not, we will never know. Walaupun dia makan duit, tapi rakyat dia jaga. Asalkan kita dapat bantuan. Even if he steals, as long as I get the help and the contribution I need. But with God, semua pun akan tahu. All truth will be laid back. There will be no misinformation or confusion or uncertainty. Even the secrets of each heart's intention, thoughts will be laid back. Verse 16 tells us that. Verse 5 and 11 says that God's judgment will be righteous and there will be no favoritism. So even if you are a religious leader, even if you are the president of the most powerful country, even if you are the richest man alive, you will not be given any special favour. All will be judged equally and the result of the judgment will be completely and perfectly fitting and fair. When we stand before God, we do not need a lawyer to defend us. There will not be any rebuttal or excuses, no buts, no saying, if only... This is scary, but at the same time, it is comforting. It is scary because we can never hide anything from God. Yes, we can hide from the people around us. We can hide from our parents, from our pastors, but not from God. All our browsing history, secret texts, anything done in secret, even our inner thoughts and intentions will surface. And yet it is comforting, especially if you have been a victim of injustice, because we know that every injustice will be made right, and those responsible will ultimately be held accountable. Now to our third point, what then is God's criteria for His judgment? Verse 6, verse 7, verse 13 tells us that God judges according to our works. Only those that have proven to do good works and obey the law of God will be rewarded with eternal life. 
at this point you must be thinking what I'm thinking too. Doesn't sound right. Aren't we saved by grace through faith alone, not by works? Sounds contradictory, right? John's thought brings clarity to this. This is what he says. No, Paul is not contradicting himself. What he is affirming is that although justification is indeed by faith, judgment will be according to works. The reason for this is not hard to find. It is that the day of judgment will be a public occasion. Its purpose will be less to determine God's judgment than to announce it and to vindicate it. Such a public occasion on which a public verdict will be given and a public sentence passed will require public and verifiable evidence to support them. And the only public evidence available will be our works, what we have done and have been seen to do." End quote. Paul is saying that works matter not for salvation, but as evidence that someone has the faith that saves. Martin Luther says that we are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. We are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. This faith brings about grateful, joyful, trusting obedience. Verse 12 to 15 is trying to tell us that regardless of whether you have been given the privilege of having the law of Moses or not, you will still be judged. You will be judged by your obedience, not in your knowing. And how does this obedience look like? Look at verse 7. Verse 7 elab elaborates that it is a persistent, a perseverance in doing good in seeking for three things glory honor immortality first by seeking glory glory that reflects the glory of god romans 8:29 defines this glory as being conformed to the likeness of his son being more and more like christ in every way secondly to seek honor Honor, longing to hear the approval of the words of Jesus that says, Well done, my good and faithful servant. The honor of having completed the race that Christ has entrusted to us. Third, seeking immortality. The word here is incorruption. Looking forward to the day of resurrection. Having incorruptible bodies. Fitting for the new heaven and new earth where God dwells fully and completely. As John Stott puts it, the unfading joy of God's presence. A genuine believer in God has a persistent and constant general direction towards the things of God, to please God, to bring glory to Him, not for selfish ambitions, not for the praise of man, not for what the world deems as important or necessary. And the reward is eternal life, life with God forever. Having said that, we don't just obey just to prove that our faith is genuine. We don't obey out of force, out of drudgery, or obey so that we may look good at God's judgment. We obey because it is a natural and appropriate response to what God has done. It is natural to want to seek for the interests, for the welfare, and to do what is best to please someone we love, someone that loves us. Think about your parents, your spouse. With my wife, Shalene, I want to do things that please her, that make her happy and not to do any harm towards her. And when we were dating, I would always write down the things that she likes, penguins, Korean dramas, flowers, so that I can take note. I'm very forgetful. So I take note of what I can do to make her happy. And now I, as a husband, I take the rubbish out. I cook porridge for her when she's sick. 
I join online competitions so that she can meet her Korean idol. And all this is done out of love. It is not forced. Maybe sometimes forced, but most of the time is out of love. And vice versa, she does that for me too. So our motivation for obedience is love. You can look at 1 John 4, 19 and chapter 5 and verse 3. It says that. And this obedience is also enabled by the Spirit. It is not forced. We love because He first loved us. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. God loved us even when we were, we were His enemies. Christ died. He died to rescue us. This calls for a serious self-examination of our hearts. Does my life show fruits of obedience? Is my life persistently moving forward in one direction only? The direction towards seeking after the glory of God, not my own glory? Is my obedience out of a burden? Drudgery? Reluctance? or out of love? Do I realize God's lavish love for me? Especially during this time of uncertainty, anxiety, thinking, what if I were to get infected? And because of how it affects the economy, will my job be affected, my salary? It is good to take this time to dwell in God's lavish love for you. Romans 8.32 assures us that if God who did not spare his own son, the best gift of all, would he not also graciously give us all things? All the things that we need? With that assurance, we can continue in obedience to all that God has called us to be and to do. Be faithful, be responsible, be loving towards our neighbour never ceasing in proclaiming the good news of Jesus. Let me conclude. No matter how religious or how good we are, we cannot escape the judgment of God. God's judgment is perfectly fair and just, and it will be according to our works. Works shows that we have saving faith in Christ. Where will we be when we see God face to face at the day of judgment? There will only be two outcomes. Are we those that will remain under the wrath of God? Or will we be those that will be declared righteous and be rewarded with eternal life? The decision lies in whether we have completely placed our faith in Jesus who stands before the judgment seat as our representative facing our charges, standing in our place, having borne our judgment upon himself, fulfilling our failed obedience, so that we bring nothing of our own merit, but only being clothed in Christ's righteousness. Let us close in prayer. Nothing in my hand I bring, Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fount fly. Wash me, Saviour, or I die. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Have a blessed week ahead.